So what a session we had yesterday as that House of Reps public hearing continues in that sector. But yes, indeed, uh, we'll focus on some of those challenges as much as time allows us to, but we do know ultimately how do we get them to work. So, uh, Mark, let's start from there. Well, thank you, Chimbling. I definitely will be getting first-hand account of what transpired yesterday as Professor Usman Yusuf, who is Executive Secretary and CEO of NHIS, uh, joins us here in Abuja. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily Prof. No, thank you very much for having me here today. Well, on day one of the hearing, uh, we did hear you say, I think it's a phrase that's going to be around for a while, that we have copied and pasted, but we haven't copied and pasted correctly. You said that if we do not know how to copy and paste correctly, then we shouldn't copy at all. Yes. Precisely what have we copied wrongly and how have we not pasted well? Good. Uh, the HMO system is essentially an American system. Mm -hmm. and I've had the privilege of practicing in Nigeria, in the UK, and most of my half, more than half my lifetime in the United States. What we did was copied the American system and tried to paste it here. And like I said, if you do not know how to paste, don't copy. Whatever you do, you have to domesticate it to what works for you. So what did we copy precisely? Right. Was the what? HMO system, right? When we brought it here, it was skewed against the little guy. Skewed towards the HMOs. As it currently operates, what Nigerians do, I, I know that when the NHIS came, there was a lot of confusion as to how it was going to operate. People were not very conversant with the system, where you had to pay a little token, and then uh, if you needed to use health care, you, you, it should be available. And then we thought that there were also some other private providers of that same service, the HMOs, they're called now. And uh, you know, people also subscribe, especially people in the private sector, subscribe to those people. Um, and and uh, it looked like, well, there have been hitches in the system. But what precisely uh, will you pinpoint as being wrongly uh, copied or wrongly pasted from the system that we've copied right. from the... Right. So whatever, whatever you do, what works in Katsina will not work in, in Abuja or Kano. Mm -hmm. You have to domesticate it. We cannot go copy everything and put it here. When you do copy it here, you have to look at your cultural system, your resources, and what your people can afford, so right? What would you advise? They have, okay, what I will advise is essentially, NHIS was created for one purpose and one purpose alone. Everything else follows. That purpose is for all the 180 million Nigerians to be covered in that. Everything else just follows. In the United States, all the 300 million uh, Americans are not covered. That was why you have Medicaid. Well, that's why you have Obamacare. Millions of people in the richest country in the world are not covered. The whole idea, I've been to all over the world, there is not a system that is perfect. That is why in my journeys we're back home now to try and make that which is not perfect somewhere perfect. So there is no system that is perfect and for us to go and copy and bring it here. HMO system, there are other countries in Africa, Kenya, Rwanda and Ghana, for example, that have achieved better coverage without HMOs. Why are we doing that? If we're going to bring HMOs in Nigeria, make it equitable. Are HMOs important? Yes. Do they have a role? Yes. What is their role? Not the current role we're playing. The role they need to play is to help the NHIS go out and accrue as many more people outside the formal sector as possible. Outside the formal sector? Absolutely. The formal sector is federal government or state government employees. That is easy picking. Already mature. 99% of our people are not employed by government. They are all outside there, the informal sector. What about the private sector? The private sector is also informal in the sense that it is not by, by formal or informal the largest chunk we have federal government employees. Channels not federal government employees. You, they, are, they are ready to go ahead and they are, they are ready to go and they are allowed to go back there and, and, and accrue people. 99% of our people do not live in Abuja, do not work for federal or state government. 
These are the people we need to go out and serve. Federal government employees are just given to us. So even the NHIS has not been able to cover successfully and effectively those who are even covered under its system. Good. So when I came, I'm the first chief executive to look at the system and say, who are the main uh, stakeholders? The NHIS is the regulator. The HMOs as the middlemen. Healthcare providers, the providers. And the, 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 the enrollees. And of course, our elected representatives who oversee us. We have all not done well for our people. That's the honest truth. And I start the blame by us, NHIS. We are the regulators. If we've done our job as we should have done over the last 12 years, we won't be where we are. And if you don't look at yourself and see where you're wrong, you can never correct it, you can never regulate well, you can never point a finger at anybody. So what was the challenge with NHIS? And what is the challenge? Right. The first thing with NHIS, and I will tell you everybody's scorecard. The NHIS, we have not done the, we have not been the regulators we need to be. And this probably is not only NHIS. You see many regulators in this country that have not, have, have not been the regulators they need to be. But I will speak for the NHIS. We are supposed to regulate health insurance in this country. We didn't do as good a job as we did. If we did, we will be covering a lot more people than we have covered today. Right? We have not played our supervisory role on HMOs. We have not played our supervisory roles on hospitals. And we have not served the enrollee well. And I have taken that responsibility and that blame because I'm on this chair. And I've exposed that for us within our house to do better. And I've told the HMOs you've not done as well too. The so question this is, is why? Why? I mean, it's one thing to identify right. that you haven't done, uh, carried out a task well. The question will be, is it for lack of competence? Is it for lack of capacity? Is it for lack of political will? What precisely is the problem? It's the lack of what I would call the goodwill to do the right thing. And this is not unique to the NHIS. Many organizations in the past, the Malay, and the fact that people we do not realize we're here to serve, not be served. And that culture has changed since this government came. Say, Nigerians, we're here to serve people. We need to kill corruption. If not, corruption will kill us. And this is the truth. We do not have our house in order. We cannot be the regulator we need to be. Just like this country, when this government came, found it in the state it was. The leadership dictates the, the ethos of any organization. And what I found wasn't right, we're trying to make it better, to serve our people. And that's why I'm here. Now, Nigerians are definitely listening to you. Perhaps some of them shaking their heads and saying it's a good thing that you admit that the NHIS has not, even the people that it's covering, has not served them well. Correct. Uh, talk more of playing its role as a regulator, monitoring other HMOs. But looking at how much has been contributed so far, would you say that the NHIS did indeed have the capacity to be able to cover as many people as it had taken on? Right. If you're talking capacity, very educated people and more motivated people in the NHIS. I have worked in many organizations. I've never seen a more educated group of people than those I found in the NHIS. Good, decent human beings. We have lawyers, doctors, nurses, engineers, everybody there. You need the leadership to lead you. And now they realize they know where, where, where we're headed. And our main purpose, one and one alone, is to serve our people, the enrollee. Enroll more people outside the formal sector, which is the informal sector, particularly the vulnerable amongst us. Pregnant women, children under five, the disabled, the aged, all of us. We get out of the comfort of Abuja or Lagos or wherever we live. We go back to our ancestral homes. Who have we left behind? Mostly the aged. Widows, widowers, women, children, the aged, the unemployed. Is this a dreamy system? No, it isn't. I mean, you talked about how... No, it isn't. You, you talked about how we copied from the United States. Yes. The system in the United States does not cover everyone. 
Uh, instead, it looks like what we have incidentally, it seems that we have the same name, uh, what we have in the United Kingdom. They have the NHIS. No, NHS. NHS, beg your pardon. Uh, just the I is, miss mm. is missing in as. And, and they seem to cover almost everybody. Who, not perfectly. Who, who, not, not perfectly, yes. but majority of people who go to the NHS are able to get service. Right. Uh, in, 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 and in right. Nigeria, it would seem that that is precisely what we want. We want as many people as come to the NHIS to be able to get service. But that doesn't seem, I mean, well, a far cry from what we see in the United Kingdom. For Good. Instance. Let's look at the United Kingdom, where I practice too. It's non profit, right? Who pays? You get a tax from everybody that works. Isn't that what we do? No. Ours is not mandatory, it's voluntary. The NHIS is voluntary. In the United Kingdom where it works, you get money cut out of your salary up front if you work. Here is voluntary. Only those that work as federal government or state government employees, do they get their money taken at source and put into the pool. So the pool is essentially populated by federal government employees and few voluntary people that, that, that go into the program. The very few cannot pay for the many. Shouldn't that be, I mean, the people who pay, shouldn't that be the cover for them? Why are we trying to take the money that a few pay to cover the entire country? Good. It's very good. So it's there in our cultures and in all scriptures. This is the reality of our situation. We, the strong, help the weak. You, the healthy, help the sick. And those that have, help those who do not have. Even in wealthy countries, it is the rich that subsidize the poor. In the United States, in the UK, everywhere in the Western world, the taxes of the rich help the poor. Shouldn't it be? that everybody will pay something, but according to your capacity. No, that is true. So even, even, even the payment within the system now, the government takes a percentage of the salary and put it in the pool. Mm -hmm. So it is how much you earn that goes into the pool. But it's essentially government employees that are covered. This is the point I want to make that the people we need to reach out to are those that are, are not employed by federal government or state governments, those that cannot pay for themselves. There, is four, there are four cardinal uh, recommendations by WHO how to fund universal health care coverage. Number one, governments should prioritize on reducing out of pockets for their people. Over 60-70% of our, of our health care spending is out of our pockets. Number two, government should maximize mandatory prepayment instead of voluntary as it is. And number three, enlarge the pool. That's what I'm trying to do. The larger the pool, the more we are able to pay for those who cannot pay for themselves. What about but four, mm. and most importantly, Government should try and pay for those who cannot pay for themselves. What about the first two? The first two about maximizing those, uh, you know, the mandatory. Are, yeah, making right. it mandatory. Correct, and that's why we are talking. We are talking and working with our elected representatives. That in our act, what we want as amendment, make NHS contribution mandatory instead of voluntary as it is. And we are working with them, and they are listening to us, and they are, they are hearing us, and they will work with us. Make it mandatory. But this is reality in Nigeria. What percentage of Nigerians are gainfully employed by either government or private? We have to think of those that are not employed. The rural and urban poor. That we should not neglect. This government is pro-poor. Whatever we do, we need to think of those who cannot pay for themselves. Let us take some questions now from my colleagues in Lagos. Well, Professor Osman, could, could you tell us, do you think that there is a 351 billion era fraud in the scheme? Did you hear me? Uh, I'm asking, do you think that there is a, 50, a 351 billion era fraud in this scheme? A 
Yes. 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 So I see all numbers thrown around. But if I'm to respond to all the numbers, it is, it is. Any number you hear outside the NHIS, coming from out of, not from, from my mouth, is questionable. I have the facts, I have the numbers. So 350 million, I don't know, billion, I don't know where people got it from. So tell us then, from me. what figures are we talking about, are we, or should we be looking at here? If you can hear me, Prof, I'm asking, what exactly is the amount in question here? Well, I hope we can sort this out. Uh, can you hear me, Prof? Doesn't look like this is well, working. It does seem like we're having some yeah. challenges with the audio from Lagos. Uh, But Chamberlain, if you can repeat your question, perhaps we'll hear you again. Well, I'm asking Prof to tell us, because we're trying to find solutions. Is there fraud there, and what figure specifically are we talking about here? Did you get catch that? Is there fraud there? Yes. Yeah. Right. Is there corruption in the NHIS? Yes. There's corruption everywhere in this country that we met. To the tune of how much, would you say? So, people make a lot of mistakes. There are three payments that we make to HMOs to either pay hospitals or for themselves, right? One is their admin fee. That is the fee they get for administering the rest of the fee. The other is capitation. NHI, uh, the, the, the HMO should just serve as conduit. We give them the money for capitation and they pay hospitals. And the other is fee for service. If a patient or his family go to hospital, they charge the HMOs and the HMOs pay. Three forms of payment. So we look at over the last 12 years. This is what I did when I came. I asked for numbers. All over the last 12 years, how much have we paid? How much has come into the NHIS? How much has reached where it needs to be? Because the whole purpose is money to reach the hospitals. You alleged padding um, in your first appearance. You said that uh, there was padding. Um, you begged the apologies from the lawmakers. Uh, you, you, you compared it what was going on with the subsidy of petroleum products, but you said the difference is that people were losing their lives. Why does padding come in here? Good. We are in the business of dealing with the lives of human beings. So this is just not an ordinary ministry or an ordinary MDA. We're dealing with the lives of people. We went to medical school to do good. So we as doctors, when we see this, we get really, really very angry. I'll tell you, we pay HMOs based on the number of enrollees or lives they have, right? These things were not done biometrically. Just like you have ghost workers in state, local and federal government, so also there was an artificial increase in the number of lives. Because what I found, what I did was to find out how much have we been paying. The number keeps going up, up, up and down. Up, up, up. There is no commensurate increase in the number of employees by the federal government. There is no death. There is no retirement. And it's based on that we pay. And it's very clear from investigations in the past by security agencies that the database has been violated and numbers increase. So how much would you say the NHIS was paying to HMS that was not supposed to be paying them? We're still investigating. And in the last, since I've been here, our investigation, we've been able to purge. And this is not news. It's been in the newspapers, I've said it. We've been able to purge 
of the register, 23,000 ghost enrollees. So if we pay a thousand a month per enrollee, that is 23 million naira monthly. And annually that will amount to 22, 288 million that we would have paid. It's a lot of money. It's people's money. We will come back and we will talk about, you know, the solutions that you are bringing to the table to ensure right. that Nigerians are able to get the service they deserve. And that will be in just a moment. Please stay with us. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor, you just heard some of the uh, comments that were made in that report. Do you think that HMOs should exist or should they not? All uh, right. Time to answer. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. HMOs are part of the act. In our in our act. And they are stakeholders too. HMOs, NHIs, and hospitals. What we need to look at, and this is for the very first time, I'm really happy in this country that we're shining the light in this industry, on this industry. The NHIs, HMOs, and, and, and hospitals. And this is progress. It's been happening over the last 12 years. There has not been any assembly that has brought HMOs to account for what they have done, or hospitals. So this is great progress. You is talk about for HMOs. If you ask me personally, we should pay money directly from the NHIS to hospitals. If the act says we should work with HMOs, we should, but find a role for them. And the role I think for HMOs in the system is that they should not have a role in the social health insurance program. They are free to go and sell their products with the recommendations of the NHIS to people outside the social health insurance, accrue more patients with our regulations. And they should serve and be close to people. Many of the HMOs we have that call themselves national HMOs do not live where people are. People have difficulty accessing them. People in Inewe, Umwahia, Arundizogu, Ogoja, Kontogura, Kano, Kazina, they're having to call HMOs living in Lagos. They call themselves national HMOs and they say they have offices all over this country. They are not close to the people. They are not empathetic to the people. We want HMOs that are close to the people, that when people call them, they will pick their phone. People can walk into their offices and they will answer their questions. So HMOs as is currently, they are not serving the purpose they are supposed to serve. They are not accruing people, they are getting money they are not accounting for, and they are not paying to hospitals. So there are major, major problems that are being looked at by this committee, and, and I hope by the end of their recommendation they will see a role, if there is any, for HMOs in this, in this uh, uh, system of ours. You said that uh, what is happening within that uh, sector is worse than oil subsidy. Could you explain more further on that? Right, so I looked at, this is me. We come from university academia where we ask questions. How much, how much have we put in and how much comes out? For the amount of money that has been invested in the system to the HMOs, and we see the miserable numbers we have, and we hear the constant complaints we hear from hospitals, and enrollees particularly. Every day I come to the office, I see petitions and people call me about services they get from HMOs or from hospitals. And I call these hospitals, and they are complaining constantly they do not get money they are, not, they are supposed to get from hospitals. I visit hospitals in Abuja where I live incognito at night just to find out how our patients are doing. Wherever I go in this country, I visit big hospitals and see how our patients are doing. All of us, we the NHIS, HMOs, and hospitals, we need to do much better than we are doing. But most importantly for me, as a regulator, 
where the money comes to, I need to be a good custodian of that which I'm entrusted with, which is our people's common wealth. Whoever I give that money to, I need to make sure that that money will reach where it needs to be. So I'll hold everybody accountable from the NHIS to the HMOs to the hospital. And I've opened my channels of communication, especially to the enrollee. I'll put him on the driver's seat for him to choose and fire his HMOs and for him to choose and fire his hospitals and for him to reach us and tell us where we're doing well or not well. But all of us are not doing well. The money that comes into the system, I do not see an output that is commensurate with the money that comes in. And that's why I am blowing the whistle. I say we need to all sit up and do the right thing for our people. And that's why you see the anger and the passion in me. It's not personal. We are here to serve our people, and that we must do. All right, Prof. If you could speak to these two items before uh, we let you go. First, the HMOs, some of them we see there saying uh, 60,000 Naira cannot be sufficient to conduct surgery. They suggest that some of those provisions and the funds need to be reviewed. And then, are you going to restructure or adjust the NHIS, who you say some of these things, the fraud, go on with complicity of NHIS? So let's start with the NHIS. The Act establishing the NHIS gives us enough power, enough authority to enforce all that it asks us to do. But we haven't done that. And we are doing that now for the first time. That's why people are taking notice. When I came, I created a department of enforcement that makes sure HMOs, ourselves, and hospitals are accountable. And people are taking notice. And I am getting letters from the little guys thanking us and praying for us and our ancestors for fighting for them. Oh, I got an alert of 5,000 the other day. Thank you for fighting for me. We shouldn't even get to that. People should know what to do for themselves, the HMOs and all of us. But we are fighting for hospitals. We are fighting for enrollees. So... In the NHIS, we are holding ourselves accountable much more than we were in terms of our finances. Procurement for the very first time is transparent in the NHIS. And legal department, we are going to be fighting for the enrollee. There are HMOs that all NHIS and hospitals, millions of naira, that will get that money back. Professor, have you been sued by the HMOs? I've been taken to court. Why have you been sued? The reason I was taken to court is they want status quo maintained. Fellow Nigerians, what is the status quo? The status quo is that less than 3% of Nigerians are enrolled. The status quo is that we cannot account for the money we've received from enrollees. The status quo is that our enrollees are not satisfied. The status quo is all the money we give hospitals, they are not accounting for that. But they allege that you do not understand the system. I do not understand the system. God help me. What is the system? That is on the one hand. That's the first allegation. The second is that you're painting everybody. Yes, hey, some HMOs might be doing the wrong thing, but you're painting everybody with the same brush. Sure. So the good should stand up. And I told some good HMOs. That you're good HMOs, you're doing things the right way, speak up. What you hear HMOs doing, they form themselves into an organization called HIMCAN. An umbrella buddy of 20 out of the 57. I'm a doctor. If I have a problem, I do not hide behind HM NMA. When I write checks to HMOs, I do not write check to HIMCAN. I write check to individual HMOs. Individual HMOs must account for their actions. And I think that that's where we all have to leave it because we have totally run out of time. Uh, thank you. Professor Usman Yusuf, we thank you very kindly for coming on Sunrise Day. Thank you for having me. He is the Executive Secretary and CEO of the NHIS. And he's been speaking to us in Abuja. Sunrise Day will continue in just a moment. Please stay with us.